So a few years ago, I was at a sediment conference, and I ended up having dinner with kind of a famous senior erosion specialist. Um, this guy is so famous in our community that his name is actually in RAS, because we use one of his equations, but yeah, I won't call him out by name. Um, but he's kind of having a second or even third act in his career, um, where he's in another country, and he's in charge of a group of modelers about 20 or 30 young modelers that are just all day using RAS to compute dam failure consequence. And he, uh, he had a beef with RAS, and uh, he took it up with me at this dinner. He said, you know, my problem with RAS is that the young engineers that I'm in charge of are treating it like a video game. They put in all the data, and then they push buttons trying to win the video game. And kind of his beef with younger engineers, um, and by younger engineers, I'm not talking about kids these days, you know, younger engineers to this gentleman would include people like me and John and almost everyone taking this class, is that we don't actually think about the problem. We put all the data in the model and then try to get the model to think for us. And we kind of skip this important step of like the entire scientific process, um, which is hypothesis formation, um, that we don't actually try to develop a hypothesis and then test it with the model, we try to get the model to think for us. So whether or not you build a numerical model of your system, you're going to build a conceptual model of your system. You either build that conceptual model kind of implicitly, like you know, a very a classic sediment conceptual model that's often unconscious is sediment isn't gonna be a problem in my system. That is a conceptual model, it's just implicit. Um, it's better to build a explicit conceptual model of your system. And that's one of the things we're gonna to try to do in this training. We're gonna to try to help you build you know, robust, explicit conceptual models of your system to come up with preliminary screening level answers to is sediment gonna be a problem and do I have to do more analysis? The term that the knowledge and learning literature use to talk about transferable conceptual models is heuristics. Um, you know, the investing community uses heuristics quite a bit because the investing community is really interested about are there kind of these simple conceptual models of our system that I can use to make reliable decisions quickly and without a lot of information. And the, you know, they describe heuristics as a problem solving method that uses shortcuts to produce good enough solutions in a limited time frame or deadline. I mean, if that doesn't sound like smart planning, I don't know what does. You know, another definition of heuristics is you know, a flexible technique for quick decisions, particularly when working with complex data. Um, and so like a colloquial um, form of heuristic, what might be rule of thumb, right? Um, and so in his book, Design of Business, Roger Martin describes um, the knowledge funnel, which I think is a helpful way of thinking about heuristics. The knowledge funnel is the constellation of methods, models, and kind of pattern recognition <clears throat> that we use to move from informational chaos, which is really a good way of describing the beginning of a lot of our projects, to repeatable predictions. And he, ad he identifies three phases in the knowledge funnel, mystery, heuristic, and algorithm. And so heuristics are kind of that intermediate step between mystery and modeling. Your know, heuristics live in that space between intuition and analysis, where you're not doing kind of expensive math yet, but you're also not just trusting your gut. And so in our projects, that turns out to be a really important space because that's the space where you decide, are, are you gonna hire a sediment modeler? Are you going to do some modeling? Or are you going to get some sort of discipline-specific ATR on your team? And so um, in his book, um, Thinking Fast and Slow, Daniel Kahneman, who won, he, Kahneman and Tversky won the Nobel Prize for their role in bringing psychology into economics. Um, and he summarizes a lot of their work in the, the kind of popular book, Thinking Fast and Slow. He describes heuristics as the process of exchanging a complex problem for an analogous but simpler problem. Now, a lot of the research is actually about how heuristic thinking can go poorly, particularly when we do it unconsciously. But when we kind of make our heuristics explicit and transferable, and we kind of say, these are the rules of thumb, these are the processes, the qualitative processes that we're going to use to think about these systems, then they can become important sc screening level tools where we can make the decision, hey, is this good enough or do we need to do more analysis of this complex system in order to see if we're going to have a problem. 
And so our goal in this class is to provide you with some pre-modeling tools. And the pre-modeling tools for sediment and morphological analysis start with these basic heuristics. And so if John and I were to try to answer some of the you know, thought experiments that we offered you just before this, um, we wouldn't just use our intuition, even though we've been at this for a long time. We would kind of turn to some of these simple but formalized conceptual models in order to answer those questions. And the reason I know we would do that is because that's what I do. When people call me and ask me about their system, if they, they, they think they might have a sediment problem, they call me and they say, hey, do I have a sediment problem? Do we need to do some analysis? Do we need to do some modeling? I don't just kind of trust my gut. I pull out a piece of paper and I, I work one of these heuristics. Um, to develop a conceptual model and give them a more reliable and transferable result. And so the, when John and I sat down and said, you know, what are the three conceptual models we use to try to think about morphological failure modes in our projects, we came up with three. Um, equilibrium thinking, lanes balance, and continuity. And so we're going to deal with those in order, and John's going to talk about equilibrium thinking. Rivers exist in a balance. Um, there are opposing forces at play. There's the force of gravity that's driving water. There's the force of friction that's resisting that force. And when those are balanced, you reach uniform flow. It's a concept that hydraulic engineers know well. But there are other processes, geomorphic processes that are at play. There's a sediment erosion and transport process. And then there's the process of, of deposition. And these forces oppose each other. And when they're in balance, then you have a stable riverbed. Uh, likewise, there's a bank erosion process, but there's also a bar building process. And when these processes are in balance, then once again, you have a stable river. Equilibrium, the equilibrium concept is that the river is going to adjust itself up and down laterally, uh, the way it meanders, in order to um, convey the flow and the sediment that is supplied to it from the watershed. And so if, if humans come in, for example, and, and we change the river, then the river is going to adjust in order to get back to the form that is optimally conveying the flow and the sediment. For example, this stream was straightened and widened. After construction, the moderate flow that used to carry sediment was spread out over a wider channel, which resulted in higher friction, lower depth, and lower sediment transport. The new imposed geometry of the river favored deposition over erosion. So what happened? Well, the channel deposited. This deposition narrowed the channel, which increases sediment transport. And this continued until the erosion and the deposition processes were once again in balance. If you haven't changed the watershed flow or sediment inputs, then eventually the channel will reform itself to optimally carry the same inputs as before. Here we see a flume showing a very common case that can be thought about using equilibrium principles, and that's a stream channelization or meander cutoff. So if the channel is in equilibrium to start with and you cut off a meander, then um, what you'll have is an increased sediment transport because of the, uh, this deepened slope. So the, the sediment transport is, is favored over the deposition and the channel is unstable. So the channel is going to adjust to bring those processes back in balance. And this could happen in several ways. So you could have a bed that degrades, just you know, at the upstream end, basically lowers, and that lowers the slope. Um, you could have a bed that deposits sediment at the downstream end, which would also lower the slope. Um, or you could increase the sinuosity again, which also lowers the slope. Equilibrium principles work in many situations, but they do have their limitations. For example, if the flow in the entire watershed changes, then all the rivers in the watershed are going to adjust. They're, they're all going to enlarge, in fact, and um, until they reach a new equilibrium with the new inputs of flow and sediment. Um, in that case, the historic river form or a stable river form upstream or downstream from your project is not going to be a good indication of what your river will evolve to, what its future form is. The other consideration is that the period of transition uh, from one, you know, from the current form to its final stable form is a period of instability. And this can cause tremendous problems for landowners, for the purposes of your project, even for the environment. And uh, this period of instability might last decades or even centuries. So the idea with using equilibrium principles to guide engineering is to be aware of 
what that future form could be and to try to design a project that is in equilibrium with the flow and sediment inputs um, that are coming into it.